The Cymbeline Bloodburn does not act within a week. Scotty calls Nomad that mechanical beastie, and Lieutenant Uhura sings. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lopton and Walter Koenig. Hello. Howdy. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of Star Trek the original series, season two, episode three, The Changeling, not that one, uh, written by John Meredith Lucas, directed by oh. Mark Daniels. This was September 29th, 1967. Where were you? How are you guys doing today? <laughs> I'm all right. <clears throat> all right. I'm okay. First things first. Walter, you chuckled when I read that this episode was written by John Meredith Lucas. What's up with that? Well, I'll tell you what. You give me 30 seconds to go halfway down the stairs, and I'll explain it to you when I come back. 30 seconds, not more. <laughs> All right. Yeah. What a way to start. <laughs> we <Yeah>. just... <laughs> All right. He's like, well, I've got the answer for you. This is going to be good, everybody. I cannot wait. Well, Sirach, without getting into too many details so that uh, Walter doesn't miss it, you've never seen this episode. I know I've never seen this episode. When you saw the title, The Changeling, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you think it might be connected in some way to yeah. uh, Deep Space Nine? I did. I did. When I, when I saw Changeling, I'm thinking... This is probably where the original Changeling story uh, came from. So I was excited uh, <laughs> to see if that was the case. <laughs> A Changeling origin story. So Walter yeah. Koenig has returned. Uh, yeah. What special item did you bring back? 80 Eight? odd years in Hollywood. Whoa. By who? It doesn't, we got to hold it up. John oh. Meredith Lucas. Okay. How about that? How about that? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I didn't, I haven't read it. Somebody gave it to me. I do remember John, not from this episode, because I'm qu quick to add that I wasn't in this episode. <laughs> um, nevertheless, <laughs> I, have, I have lots of opinions about it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd give, I, I don't know with, with John is mm -hmm. still with us at this juncture or not, but um, he's got a book about his well, life. You, so. you also said yeah, that he, he was he passed a, away in 2002. 2002. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. Yes. You also said that he was a producer on the show. I mean, most writers are also producers, you know, in one way or another, at least in, you know, the way the writing works. But you viewed him on the show as more of a producer than a writer. Is that right? I did. I did. Uh, he came in. I don't recall precisely when he um, began doing that, but it was in the, in the middle of the season. I'm talking about season two or perhaps season three. I don't really recall, but I do remember him in that, in that uh, posture, in that position. Yeah, it says he's credited as producer for the latter part of second season. So, okay, uh, That's yeah, the it. second half of the second season, uh, he was um, credited, but he did direct a few episodes. It looks like he directed three of the episodes in 68. Right. Uh, the, the Ultimate Computer, The Enterprise Incident, and Elon of Troyes. Troyes. Yeah. So um, he's directed, he's written, and he was a producer. So he's pretty heavily involved in that second season. Indeed. Indeed. He seemed a nice enough fellow. He, he, was, um, he wasn't gregarious. He wasn't... Uh, outgoing but he certainly seemed approachable yeah and i and i'm looking at uh his filmography going back to 1943 so he's like whoa yeah that's why yeah. he wrote a book yeah that's why he wrote a book about 80 years in the business this, he was in the business for 80 years so. <laughs> right right wow sounds like yeah. the westmore family 
So, well, let's get into this episode more specifically because Walter, you said very strongly that you have opinions on this episode. I've never seen this episode before. Sirach has never seen this episode before. Have you seen this episode before? No, no. On the other hand, it's almost prototypically science fiction. It, it, it the driving force is a uh, is a uh, premise that has been used again and again. And I could even name you Star Trek episodes, and mm -hmm. including including even V'ger, yep. you know, Star Trek the motion picture. There was always the that sense of some force behind the scenes that is organizing the world and, and and structuring it and in charge. And that one of the things that occurs is that if you want to get rid of it, you confuse it. You know, we did that in I Mud uh, mm -hmm. when we all started dancing, you know, and did it here and it kind of goes a little nuts. So it's it's a um, an exercise that is repeated uh, again and again in science fiction. Very familiar. Uh, yes, Walter. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with you. It's uh, when you said that it made me think of um, yeah, a lot of uh, oh no, a lot of the movies that I've watched. Um, I was thinking of two thousand one Space Odyssey uh, that oh. are yeah, yeah, Arthur yeah. C. Clarke um, with the computer, you know going rogue and attacking Hal or whatever. And that, that kind of idea of technology, something that we create going rogue, Terminator 2, Terminator is about yep. that. Uh, the rise of the machines, killing the people. I mean, you talk about the idea of some kind, even now we're talking about artificial intelligence and, you know, what kinds of powers would it have and how would it, you know, how we, put some kind of guardrails on it because we're scared of it, you know, losing control and, you know, uh, exterminating us, uh, you know, as mankind. So this idea is something that is recycled a lot, uh, as you mentioned, Walter. Yeah. And what I found interesting was that the first thing I wrote down was a lot of dialogue, a lot of music, and um, I think they compens they compromise they complement each other. Uh, when you have that much talking, <laughs> you gotta have some music, you know, to to keep it vital and entertaining. And so it's just inundated. It seemed to me with a musical score that just went on and on. Um, not that it bothered me, uh, but I was aware of it. I was aware that there was an awful lot of music and an extraordinarily an extraordinary amount of dialogue. I mean, we just kept explaining what was happening and who it was and why it was here and what it wanted to accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. Even to the point where you had, uh, with Spock's mind meld, you had Spock doing exposition, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. No. yes. Which, which is bizarre. Um, but on what on what what was going on? I thought. Well, actually, I thought it was kind of ingenious, kind of creative to find all these different ways of telling the story, uh, and, yeah. and and they did indeed do that. That's a good point. They had to just keep trying to figure out a different way to to attack the same problem, where which is they want to tell more of the story, uh, because there's not much they can show. They can't show the origin of this robot. You know, they can't show what it went through they can't show it so they have to just keep telling the story in different ways uh that's a good point can we ask you walter by the way so it's, we uh the first episode you were in that first episode of season one you were in the first episode of season two and you're in most of the episodes throughout the season and the next one do you remember when they were filming this do you remember why you were not in the episode were you not available did they were you still were they kind of on a as needed basis what was the situation there if you remember it's pure speculation on my part um because i was not under contract okay which and that meant that if i worked a day i got paid a day if i worked a day when i was under contract i got paid a week 
So mm -hmm. uh, that was the difference of being under contract. Now, this first year, I was on a, we'll see how he works out, you know. Mm -hmm. So if they could, um, if, they, if they could find an, a, an excuse to use me in a very modest uh, way, they would do that as, I think, as kind of a test of how I, the audience is reacting to me, uh, how I, uh, how suited I am for the role, et cetera, et cetera. So there was an economic uh, uh, element, I think, involved in uh, in in being able to to not use me as they did in in this particular the changeling. They didn't they didn't need my character. The, nobody in the navigation navigation navigator seat was doing anything terribly important via the story. So, um, yeah, that's the only thing I could think of. Of course, you know, I was just grateful when they called my name. Uh, because, as I said, there was no guarantee. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I don't know that, um, you know, th th this episode is, is not that good to me. Like right what? off the top, and then, and Sir I'm Rock thinking, P. Lofton. Yeah, well, it's because Walter, you're not in it, so that was uh, uh, nice. Uh, and, bless your heart. Uh, oh, one reason because I, you know, you you add something to this show that um, I felt was missing in this episode. Um, it, 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 the story was moving along um, a little bit clunkily to me. One of the things, you know, what that was one of the things. The other thing was, um, you know, the the actual nomad that they used in this, I, I, it didn't, it didn't sell me on the idea that they were trying to, to use. Uh, was it the string? Like nine, was it, it the string like that you could see? <laughs> is, is that was yeah. that the reason? Because we could actually see the string holding it. <laughs> it looked like 1950s, you know. Yes, looked... yes. It, the it other was, thing, it dated. Go ahead. Yes, it was dated. The, yes. The other thing is that was I thought interesting was what Mark Daniels did the director was. It seemed to me like at least seventy percent of the shots were close-ups, and it was to keep you involved. When you have that much dialogue, uh, the te the tendency is uh, uh, to and, and you're and repeating to to some degree the same thing over and over, but just using different words. You mm -hmm. need to hold the audience. You need to embrace them, and they bring the the images close to you. There, it's it's you you're more likely to to be involved in the story because they're right there talking to you, you know? And so a lot of the dialogue, at least 70% was close up. And, uh, and without exaggeration, the other 20 to 30% was uh, medium close up. You know, it's it was about the size of, of us, of, of you, Sirach, yeah. right now. Uh, very, very few masters. They just want to hold, because there was so much dialogue, they had to hold on to the audience, keep them, keep them interested. So I right. thought that was, was a good, it was a good, good thing to do. That's a really good point. I didn't even notice that, but when you have a lot of dialogue, you're going to lose the audience unless that dialogue is Shakespearean. And so in order to make something seem a little bit more intense or more interesting, you get these right. close shots. And even if somebody's saying, I really want ice cream. It's just a little <laughs> bit more interesting if you can see <laughs> every little movement. Or that's a good right. point. I hadn't even noticed that. Um, so well, that's Ciroc, why I'm here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Well, that's what we need you here for. So Sirak is on record saying this is the worst episode he's ever seen. That's what I heard. No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. No, <laughs> it, it, it just was moving along a little clunkily for me. Um, there were elements that I thought were interesting about it that weren't explored to the degree that I wanted them explored. The, the biggest one was the fact that this was uh, essentially two robots that made it in, to some degree, right? Or, yeah. or, mm -hmm. or, or merged. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked some more kind of you wanted to watch. background. 
I didn't, I didn't want to watch that, but I wanted to see some, I would have liked to see some exploration on that particular subject just to see how is it possible that these kinds of technologies could uh, integrate themselves. Um, what was the other technology? Where did it emanate from? Was it, you know, are we talking Romulan, Klingon? What kind of technology is it, you know? Uh, um, that would have been interesting for me as well, because as a science, on the science tip, to have a little bit more background about this merging of human technology with this foreign alien technology, and how did those systems integrate, right? I mean, are they using the same circuitry? Um, uh, is the elect electricity po power source, is it the same? Like, I, I would have liked some more explanation about that as a as a nerd. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, uh, my own personal opinion on this episode is that I just felt like there wasn't enough subject matter to spread over 50 minutes. I felt like mm -hmm. like the the great Bilbo Baggins quote from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> At the, I was trying to remember if it was from The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, but it's from the beginning of Lord of the Rings. He says, I feel thin like butter spread over too much bread, right? And that's kind of, it felt like they had... 25 to 30 minutes of subject matter that they had to fill 50 minutes worth because I was just kind of like, okay, I get, I get it. I understand what's going on, but they just, I felt like, you know, whether it's too much dialogue or too much exposition, I just felt like they're just 50 minutes is a lot to cover. And, you know, after that Star Trek was 42 to 43 minutes and we felt like they had to cram too much in there. We had the opposite feeling where we wished it was longer. This one, I felt like Maybe a maybe a subplot, a B plot would have been great. You know, like a B plot where something else is being destroyed or some people are trying to capture it or something. That's where I felt it was lacking for me. I just and uh I, I pictured, I actually when I was watching, I pictured Sirak falling asleep to this. Uh, but I guess you you didn't be. <laughs> but that that was my qualm with it. Uh yeah. Um what saved it for me, because I, I, I understand what you're saying, that it was like spread out too much and it felt like it was going on and on. And that's one of the things what I'm saying about how clunky it was. It was just like it was, come on, let's I get it. Let's move this story faster. Let's have some other kind of imminent danger going on. They could have given it some more um, danger, I would say, or feeling of some kind of eminent danger they did at some point with the life support system being shut down but even that i would have liked to see maybe you know guys breathing hard heavy and it's you know the air is getting thin they, they didn't ampl amplify the danger well four guys uh, did get zapped which i thought was the best special effects i've ever seen oh <laughs> the, the one oh, the God. one where he falls over the rail look he's got square yeah. lasers i loved it look at square oh, lasers Anyway, sorry, Sir Yeah, what were you yeah. <laughs> that's I argyle. Thought the, I <laughs> thought the the stunt of of what's happened. I I've lost the. I'm going to. Oh, there you are. Okay, when Scotty goes flipping over the rail. Yeah. I don't know how they did that. Mm. There was no. I've seen I seen Scotty fly across the room like in Who Mourns for Adnaeus Adnaeus. Adonis, yep. uh, <laughs> and 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 he was attached to a cable, and they yeah. and the cable you know pulled him and he went flying, but there was nothing there. I don't know how they did that. It was a, a, really a, a wonderful stunt. I mean, he just flipped over this mm -hmm. little rail, but yeah. I don't know how they did it. I thought it was really good. There are a couple that of things good. that I. There are a couple of things that. Uh, 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 for me, uh, uh, for the first time, you know, I haven't seen every episode, and obviously I haven't been in in every every episode. But uh, there are a couple of things I thought, oh, that's I haven't seen that. The Uhura, when she loses her mind, something happens to to, to the, yeah. her thinking process. I didn't quite get how that happened, but I thought she looked absolutely stunning when she was she was no longer dressed in the uniform. She just had like a hospital garment on or something and she was uh trying to do something exercise her 
brain power. I thought she just looked absolutely beautiful and charming and and uh, it was great. I, I loved that moment. I'd never seen that moment before in Star Trek mm -hmm. with, with, mm -hmm. with Michelle. So that was yeah. that was great. A curious moment, a very curious moment is the first moment that we see Scotty yeah. is in a, in a close-up. There's no establishing shot. He, it goes from no Scotty to Scotty is there. <laughs> and I hadn't seen yeah. that before. I hadn't seen that before. So that I thought was interesting. Do you think that's sometimes just when they missed the coverage or the coverage didn't look good? You know, they, they got the establishing shot because most directors aren't going to miss an establishing shot if it's necessary. But sometimes maybe when in post they see that it doesn't work, the lighting isn't good, or they see a light switch or who knows what it is. But sometimes it's just that they go, well, we just got to cut that out. And there he is. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure mm -hmm. that's true. Hmm. Yeah, he well, did pop up out of nowhere. I, I, I thought I thought McCoy kind of popped up in the transporter room with with no lines when they first got in there, um, and he's just standing there. And I, I didn't remember a reference to him at all. It was kind of unusual to just see a character just standing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Walter, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned Scotty's stunt, um, mm, yeah. and I wanted to ask you uh, because. You were not in this episode, but we got to see at the beginning of the episode, everybody flying around to the left <laughs> and flying over to the right and then flying over to the left again. I was getting seasick. And I was kind of wondering if you recall, you weren't in this one, but obviously you lived through these kinds of situations, these kinds of stunts or scenes. Do you remember what the direction was? Like, did they give you a loud bang that they cut out in post did they say all right everybody fly to the left in three two one like what what was the behind the scenes thing to just get everybody doing the same kind of thing i have no memory of it whatsoever <laughs> no, i do remember that we were told okay everybody everybody toss and turn in your seats and that was pretty much it. It wasn't any more technical uh, <laughs> than that. You know, and we did, we just did it. And this was the state of the art at, at the time, you know. Uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, include the motors under our seats until uh, uh, the voyage home. You know, mm -hmm. that's when we had motors under our seats. And the seats actually vibrated. But uh, we were just doing this all the time. And, you know, we accepted it as that, that was what was available and that's what we did. And so it went. Yeah. I feel like Star I was Trek was, I was just going to say, I feel like Star Trek was one of the first or maybe the first that invented like the camera shake and then everybody react to that, <laughs> you know, and then since then it's just kind of, you know, the standard. But what were you saying, Ciroc? Well, I remember... Our, our directions were similar to what you were saying, like left, right, those kinds of like camera shake moments. Um, oh, you so, had the same thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever when, have any? Did you ever have any centerfolds of Playboy that you were asked to look at when you were looking out at space? No, but I would have been a lot more focused had I. <laughs> I we did, locked in. <laughs> and I've always considered one of my hidden but most extraordinary moments on film, a moment that marked me as one of the, the great artists of the 2021st century. And we've got to go to a commercial, everybody. We will be <laughs> right back. No, I'm just kidding. All right. We do actually, this is the perfect timing for this. Uh, let's hear it, Walter. So this is what catapulted you to stardom. Which is what, you know, we, we, pressured the academy to include me in uh, the, their membership no they didn't include me but they should have <laughs> if, if they had not seen this moment beautiful centerfold from playboy magazine and Chekhov is sitting there saying captain i don't know what that is <laughs> <laughs> oh poor Chekhov. <laughs> they, 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 uh... so we all had the same point of view 
<laughs> so they really would do that. They would have Playboy oh, centerfolds yeah. and they would just say, all right, everybody uh, focus on this. Yeah. And then yeah. Uhura was like, I'm turning around and just going to handle my. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Oh, that's, Real that, that's baseball, how you then. get, that's how you get somebody to focus in on the close up. <laughs> yeah. So instead of just giving a, uh, a tape mark to look yeah. at and say, here, sure. focus in on that. When you see yeah. something different like that, you're definitely going to lock in uh, eyes wise. That's, that's hilarious. Love it. So let's jump into our very quick break. Uh, and we will come right back everybody on the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Walter Koenig and Sirach Lofton. It is time for the Trivioids of the Week. Everybody can't wait for the Trivioids, so guess what? You don't have to. Here they are. There's no reason... No, sorry. There's no response from the Malurians. The Cymbeline blood burn does not act within a week. The Enterprise shields absorbed energy equivalent to 90 photon torpedoes. Nomad's mission is non-hostile, theoretically. Nomad has a protective screen. A probe called Nomad was launched in the early 2000s. Remember that? Lieutenant Uhura sings. Scotty calls Nomad that mechanical beastie. And Nomad requires tapes to repair the unit. All right. Tapes. Oh, how we miss tapes. And it is funny to see old sci-fi shows that talk about times that have actually now passed. Like when they say, oh, we launched a thing called Nomad in the early 2000s. We now actually remember what happened in the early 2000s. You know, this was, you know, 35 or 40 years after this aired. Um, but now right. for us, it's in the past. It's 20 years in the past. Anyway, so yeah. that's the story there. Do, do we know who the actor was who did the voice of Nomad? Let's check that out. It is Vic Perrin. That Vic, sounds familiar. Vic Perrin. That's that's an actor's name. I've I've heard that name. So he's been around. Yeah. Uh, also, since you were talking about uh, the director friend, Mark Daniels, just wanted to pull him up very quickly. Good smile. He does look very 50s and 60s. Is yeah. that the man you, re you remember, Walter? Yeah. I, I, he wasn't, we weren't friends, but I do remember him. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we do, um, when we do Trouble with Tribbles, I'll get into it more. No. Okay. Trouble um, with Tribbles. No, sorry. I mud. When we do I mud, I'll get into it more. Got it. And what were you saying, Sirach? I was going to go a little bit into the uh, dialogue that Walter was talking about earlier. Um, for one, there was one line that jumped out to me it just as being a real dated and kind of super chauvinistic and that was uh that unit is a woman a mass of conflicting <laughs> impulses and when i heard that i was yes. thinking oh that's that's <laughs> that's that was funny for the male writers at the time but <laughs> it's you know it's just not appropriate uh yeah, like dudes days. don't have conflicting impulses. <laughs> we have very <laughs> conflicting yeah. impulses too, man. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like that. It just, it I just kind that. of. Yeah, it was, and it was coming from Nomad, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. you know, they they were asking Nomad to fix Ahura, and it was saying, you know, that that unit is a woman, a mass of conflicting impulses, something to that effect. But you know, yeah, yeah, uh, it just was tasteless for for the uh, as as it is aged um and that was one of the elements of the script that i wasn't the best i wasn't really i i just didn't believe and that was when ahura got her mind erased by the computer uh having her read you know, know. cat in a hat and you know 
trying to say the word blue, bluey, and all of those things that I, I thought that was horny to me. Uh, you she know, remembered, to, she basically completely re educated an entire yeah. lifetime of education before yeah. Walter came back in the next episode. So that's why he had, it wasn't yeah. like, he's not going like, yeah. I wondered why I came back the next week and she was at yeah. a seventh grade reading level. Nope. She just whoosh, <laughs> yes. flew right through. Yeah. What a genius. She's but in she college, at uh, college level by the end of the yeah. episode. I'm that's like, right. Really? That's right. That's what but she said. did speak college. Swahili, which was really cool. So you erased your mind, but you knew Swahili. I mean, this is <laughs> <laughs> that's why I was like, I didn't buy any of that. That whole part, I didn't buy it at all. Because first of all, how are you going to relearn everything in that fast and then become the chief, you know, uh, communicator on on this the and you know on this ship? This is not going to happen. You're going to be re-educated. You'd have to go through a whole process that would be years long. Uh, mm -hmm. having it, having it happen in one episode, I thought was just like not believable, even though I did like the chemistry that I saw between Majel and Uhura in those scenes. I thought they had a good like chemistry together that would have been good for other scenes as opposed to this particular teaching you how to say the dog has a ball. Um, so yeah, I wasn't excited about that. Yeah, that chemistry right there, that that yeah. moment felt good. I know? wish I they had. Like, I wish yeah. they had explored that more. Like, if we're talking about a B plot, how cool would the B plot have been if it just showed them before they run into Nomad, Uhura and Chapel being friends, doing something you know friendly together, playing cards or having a drink Talk or something like that. Yeah. And so then that yeah. would that scene then would have worked much more because now we know they're friends, they care about each other, they know they have a trust there. Yes. Yeah, I did like the chemistry too, and I wished I'd seen more of it. You want to know the answer? Oh boy, it was do I. 1967. The supporting actors did not get pivotal roles on the episodes. They were there. You knew what color uniforms they were wearing, but they did not get to stand out. So Major, notwithstanding that she was Gene Roddenberry's wife, and Michelle as a supporting actress under contract, they were still supporting actors. And that that film was reserved for DeForest, Leonard and, and Bill. So they were they were basically used for plot development, but not that's character it. development. Right. Exactly. Oh, that's such a ripoff. It's unfortunate because there was good chemistry there, and I would have liked to hear some of the conversations they would have had kind of in a private heart-to-heart. -heart oh, sure. You know, sure. Two women talking on the ship. That would have been good for the time and, and probably have aged well. But, um, you know, the the other thing that bothered me in this episode, I mean, it just bothered me. I, I could not get over it, was the fact that this uh, nomad robot was just like killing, killing, disappearing crew members. <laughs> and there was little to zero uh, mourning or compassion or Reaction, it was like, oh, yeah, no, yeah it was, the, the end episode ended on one of those funny like da, 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 moments <laughs> where it's like, yeah. you know, oh, that was shucks. the price is right right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was like, how are you going to end the episode on that when you just lost four crewmen? That were zapped into oblivion. But you have to keep this in, in focus. Each, and I swear to this, and I will go to my death, which may be sooner than I think. Oh. <laughs> um, those four crew members, now listen clear, carefully, Sarah, wore red uniforms. So, hey, it's okay. Uh. They can go. Okay. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have to mourn them. <laughs> they also okay. had very few lines. So basically, DeForest, yeah. Leonard, and Bill, they got character development, plot development. They got all this stuff. The supporting cast, they sure. didn't get character development, but they also didn't die. Then you had the, the guy that just yes. shows up for the day or the background or has one line or nothing. 
they get there they're dead nobody even notices they died they go hey how come this clipboard's still here oh i think crewman jeffries just died <laughs> who i don't know someone the guy with know. the red shirt yeah it was a couple guys with red shirts yeah, we'll get some more shirts. We we need to order some more shirts. Yeah, I was gonna say there's an there's an empty uh, <laughs> That's crew it. quarters with clo- with a closet full of red shirts. So I'm guessing he was a red shirt guy. I don't know. He was. He was. In fact, yeah. I was this when 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 it ended. I was so sure that we we're gonna throw in a teaser of the next week's episode in mm. which they would discover this extraordinary storage space full of red uniforms <laughs> that they could use <laughs> for disposable crew members yeah, yes, what a missed yes. opportunity there uh, huh? uh, boy God. oh boy <laughs> so I, i'll tell you that there were other moments though that i liked though um you know i like when mccoy says what do we do now go up and knock that was a nice well go go, go up go up what when the nomad gets beamed aboard and they're trying to communicate, they don't know how you know to communicate with it. And McCoy says, "What do we do now? Go up and knock? Like you know, do we oh, go and knock oh, on that, the thing?" That's that's a good line. That's a good line. It's a good line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I liked that we had a new character introduced that did not die, uh, at least new to me, and his name was Mister Singh, an Indian engineer. Uh, I don't believe he was among the people that died. Those guys were security. I wonder if, I'm sure he must have been back again. Do you remember him at all, Walter? Oh, my God. Do I remember him? No, I never I never heard him. I don't remember if he's <laughs> recurring. Let me see. Yeah, he was referred to as the unit in this episode. Uh, it was nice. Kind of dehumanizing for a lot of the people. This unit, that unit, the unit. Okay, so he was... Okay, that's why Walter doesn't remember him. He was only in two episodes. In this episode, he was Mr. Singh. And then in the season one episode, Space Seed, he was Spinelli, which definitely suits him, I think. Yeah. Hey, my name's Vinny Spinelli, everybody. Guess what over here? I'm going to have a hot dog. Uh, So... (laughs) I tell you what, what I did... What I didn't like about this character that you're talking about, this Singh character, Kirk says to him, uh, I want you on guard, watch watch the robot thing. And he puts him in a room with the robot. Then five seconds later, they cut to him kind of walking off, looking over here to the paneling, while the robot literally just walks out, you know, floats out of the door. Yeah. And I'm thinking you have one job, bro. We, we don't need you looking at the panels and doing well, that's, all this other stuff. That's why actually I was reading behind the scenes. I uh, That's why we never saw him again was because Mr. Singh realized that day that he just didn't want to be in Starfleet. He wants to go and explore on his own and just he doesn't all yeah. like all these rules and all this. Ah, yeah. he just wanted to he wanted to have fun. What do you think, Walter? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's ironic that the gentleman who played Mr. Singh ended up being a uh, a vocalist in a band. Because you know? <laughs> he can <could> sing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So Speaking we had of Uhura singing, Sings actually, Ahura was singing. Yeah, and that was another thing that you know. Um, so this, you know, I just couldn't get that. The whole Ahura storyline didn't sit well with me. Her singing, um, and and she was singing really loudly yeah. on the bridge. Yeah, uh, what Sulu, was going on? Yeah, yeah. Sulu's standing right there. There's other people there. It's not like she was by herself in her quarters or something. She's on the bridge. Sulu's like t- four feet away from her. Uh nobody's going to be like, you know, hey, you know, can, you're distracting me. I'm trying to do some work over here. It was it for that long of a period, too. It's not like she was just humming a little bit or singing just a, like a, a, a one line of the song. Right. She was out. She was going for it. <laughs> so I didn't I think, buy it. I, th- I think you're a, a little um, a, a little hostile on this. Uh, <laughs> 
the, the whole point was, and not everybody knows this, there was supposed to be a spin-off episode hmm. about Sulu being tone deaf. Um, <laughs> Walter's got jokes right. today, man, a lot. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, laugh he's rolling. Go he's ahead and laugh rolling. at me. He's practicing. <laughs> Everybody, check out Walter Koenig at the Laugh Factory in Hollywood <laughs> yes. this Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I did want to but, just to finish off on Mr. Singh. When I watch these episodes now and I see a character from one episode or multiple episodes that's an actual crewman, a crew person, a yeoman, an engineer, I always think Strange New Worlds, which is the series that takes place a few years before the original series, uh, not in real life, but in, 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 uh, in universe, I think, you know, they could have a Mr. Singh in strange new strange new worlds i think it would be great if they introduced mr singh and gave him a little bit more than the wandering board engineer guy but you know so look forward to that maybe we'll see mr singh someday i think that'd be cool yeah i can't uh <laughs> what was your take on that vulcan mind meld with the uh with the robot walter how'd you like I that it, i thought it was absurd <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. He's he's pressing his fingers against a piece of metal, a hunk of tin. Yeah. And then he records it and tells you what, what he heard. Holy cow. Now, I thought that was taking the idea, a good idea that Leonard came up with, and totally bastardizing it and making it ludicrous. It's, yeah, I, I agree with you. I was like, really? He's mind melding with an iPhone. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it no, didn't make sense. It doesn't me. have a mind. It doesn't. <laughs> but we've seen similar things, um, and I feel that they are similarly absurd. When sometimes they, in the next generation, they treat Data, who is an android, similarly. I, they they can mind meld with him. He gets drunk. You know, just like everybody else gets yeah, drunk. But data and like, steps, and see, this made me appreciate Data more, this episode. It made me think, if you're going to bring a robot on and it has this kind of uh, personality, at least make it be an android so that I can relate to it. Um, so that's why I made me, this made me appreciate Data more. Right, because uh, for all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. The only difference is yeah. one looks like a probe, the other one looks like a human. Uh, but they're yeah. both artificial intelligence. They both have their thing. They both learn. Uh, the funniest thing to me about Nomad, and I also noticed that this is done on The Orville, which is the sci-fi show uh, created by Seth MacFarlane. They also have a robot with a very plain face. There's no expression. There's It's like a, a helmet. Okay, so you don't see. Mm -hmm. Same thing with this. They're showing Nomad reaction shots, which was so funny to me. How can you show a reaction <laughs> shot of this thing? It can't react. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, oh my God, yeah. Nomad, I can't believe it. And it's like cut to Nomad, just a, a silver plate. <laughs> and I'm like, what are, we, what are we looking at here? It's not reacting. Anyway, that was very you know, funny. The, the, the original title of this episode was not The Changeling. It was called Suspension of Disbelief. Mm. That was the original title. Yeah, I, I called it robot suicide. Uh, <laughs> robot <laughs> chicken. What I thought. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, Kirk, the creator, um, that was a little bit clever. But, you know, the whole Jackson Roy Kirk backstory. I mean, there was a lot of things that were real big stretches for your imagination. You had to put a lot of things together. This thing, this robot scanned the entire computer system and didn't didn't know that Kirk was not its creator. I mean, there's, there's, there was too many things that I had, I just had problems with as far as um, storyline, but I wanted to ask you, cause this is one thing that I did think of and it, it was probably around this time. So it's, I, I thought of when, when Spock did the mind meld with Nomad, he says, he says, I am the other nomad, error, imperfection, must sterilize. 
we are no nomad, our purpose is clear. And when I started to hear those things, it actually made me think of Scientology. Um, because one of the aspects of Scientology is to remove errors, to kind of sterilize, to clear yourself. And I thought, I wonder if that was some element that was extrapolated upon to to come up with this idea of they're also really that. good at those stress tests when you're walking along and they're like hey do you want to test your stress out and you're like please don't leave me, leave <laughs> yes, me alone yes, i don't yes. i don't know I, whatever it is no thank you i don't oh no just two minutes to, oh you're very stressed oh is that right boy where do i make the checkout to um, I just uh, <laughs> we only have a few minutes left, but here's something very interesting, possibly. Yeah. When Uhura was learning everything in the world in 45 minutes, <laughs> she, she said the dog is Bluey. I know Bluey to be an actual animated cartoon, and Bluey, the character, I believe, is a dog. So I wonder if somebody was watching this episode of Star Trek and she said the dog is Bluey, they took that and they created a character named Bluey, the dog. Here it is. I want to pull him up right now. Yeah, it's a dog. I've never seen it, but I know that Bluey is a very popular, uh, Sirach, if you remember our good friend meteorologist Katie Nicolau, she loves Bluey. A lot of people yeah. love Bluey. It's just this weird blue dog named bluey oh, my so god. my yeah. god I, it's I, just i'm i'm just so i'm so awed by the depth of your knowledge and <laughs> and how you have such a sense of history bluey absolutely it gives me chills to think that you came up with that well, it gives me chills that you had the <laughs> you ego to think that anybody would be interested. <laughs> oh, you watch. Uh, when the free yeah. fall comes up in a few minutes, You'll see. somebody's going to mention Bluey. I, I, I have faith of the heart <laughs> of that course. somebody's going to mention Bluey. Maybe not, though. And if they don't, yeah. I, will, because I don't want to be just yeah, right. hanging out there. Walter's like, I have not watched these episodes in my entire life. I've waited 87 years to review Star Trek <laughs> to get you to say, you know, in 2018, there was a cartoon dog named Bluey. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the seventh rule, Walter. This is this is it. <laughs> All right. Uh, but we are almost out of time. So let's talk about the uh, home run of the episode. Sirach Lofton, who do you say gets the home run of today's episode? Cheers. Oh, God, the home run of the episode. Oh, guys. Yeah. Come on, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna give it to um I'm gonna give it to McCoy. <laughs> uh when he says, I could have told you that without looking. <laughs> he had a couple of lines that were that were some good ones. So I, I'm giving it to McCoy. Mm. What about you, Walter? Well, notwithstanding that was a very perceptive, uh almost profound. Uh, bit of information that we received from Sirach. I'd like to give it. God, you guys just don't you don't take me seriously. I don't know what the matter is. What, Walter? Uh, <laughs> the, the four guys in the red shirts. That's who I give it to. You know what? In that baseball, set a, it set a precedent. That we we have we've seen on T-shirts, we've seen yeah. on the stage, we've seen everywhere. Yep, historic. Yeah. You know, and all they it's did historic. was walk, and four walks <laughs> equals one run, and that's like a home run. Look at this boy! <laughs> oh, God. How good! Oh, God. oh my God! What a team. Now I'm really awed. I'm. I'm <laughs> that was pretty good. 
That I was pretty nothing, good. I have nothing left to say. <laughs> You'll find something. Uh, so the home run, for, it's kind of tough for me. I didn't think this episode was that great, honestly. Uh, it's kind of tough what? for me. The home run, you know, you know who gets the home run for me? Uh, William Shatner, actually, because this was the first episode we've done so far where I noticed his acting style, the way he pops and he pops, he hits that first consonant and all of those impersonations that people do. I saw it kind of take form in this episode. And I know some lines, he just rattles through it really quickly and almost under his breath. And then other episodes he really emphasizes. And I'm not sure how I felt about it, but I noticed it and it made things more interesting. It gave us an interesting performance. Mm -hmm. And so I would give it to him. Um, but it was nice seeing Nurse Chapel. It was very nice seeing Majel. Uh, all right. Well, let's say thank you to some of our besties. Not beastie, like Scotty says. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Seagull, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, My Life from Tokyo, V. Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfee, Marsha, classic Schreier. We might be seeing her on the other side of this break. Uh, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, and of course, the legendary Jason Oaken. Great. <laughs> all right all right everybody stick around we've got the free for all up next we will be right back on the seventh rule hello everybody welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach lofton and walter koenig this is the free for all you've waited patiently for it here it is finally with melissa longo <laughs> hi <laughs> we've got our pal jason m oaken also here carrie schwent What's up? Uh, we've yeah. got the Dark Lord, Chris McGee. We've got the Light Lord, Allison Leach Hyde. And we've got the In Between Lord, Greg Kenzo, out in Hawaii. Uh, all right. First things first. Oh, man, this is going to be fun. I like this part. <laughs> Sirach Lofton guesses the IMDb score. I'm going to give it, uh, I'm going to say it's a 6.1. 6.1. Uh, what about you, Walter? Now, everybody that goes on IMDb or has an account, they can rate it. They can give it a 10, 5, 1, whatever. And, you know, we kind of figure out, we guess. What, what do we think the fans gave it in the aggregate? What do you think on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, see... My thinking is corrupted by the fact, and it's a totally wrong word, but I felt it sounds impressive, so I'm using corrupted, uh, <laughs> by the fact that this was one of the first times we saw this premise on Star Trek. So the third episode, second year. So it was fairly novel at that juncture. It wasn't something that had been repeated again and again. So I give it, I give it, uh, I give it hands for that, for it being an, an initial uh, kind of concept uh, for Star Trek. So I'll give it a seven seven. Does anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? I think Melissa already knows. That's why she's no. <laughs> giggling. Oh, wow. How do you know? As I looked. <laughs> I cheated. <laughs> she peaked. Greg Kenzo says seven. Anybody else? Oh, they, they rate them? Because it can these? do a 6.8. Yeah. Yeah, on, on fingers. <laughs> so, well, the answer is 
Walter Koenig, almost spot on 7.6. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> when I guessed, I'd... I was more on Ciroc's side. Same. <laughs> Wow. Mm. You nailed it, Walter. Yeah. Did we probably have to for see? the exact for the exact reason that you said, Walter? Uh, it being, mm. you know, the, the first of its kind in that yeah. department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot I mean, of times when we watch something that's sixty years old, we say, "Oh man, this is such a typical sci-fi trope, boring." <laughs> but they were the first. Yeah. So you you know, you gotta look at it. Whoa, this is the one that created the sci-fi trope or one of the ones that created. So so that's kind of yeah, something to consider. Yeah. Um, did we have any non-appearance mentions? I didn't hear any. All right. Well, let's just get into this. Melissa Longo, what did you think about this particular episode entitled The Changeling? Well, <laughs> um, actually, I have to admit that I watched the beginning of this episode three or four times because I didn't get it. <laughs> it wasn't going into my brain. So it, I, I, it took a minute for it to capture my attention. So I had to rewind it and rewatch and rewatch. But with that said, having watched it, I do think, and I'll echo some of the stuff that you were just saying, that it was very innovative um, and very, the thing I love about watching these episodes is that even though in 1967, technology was in its infancy still, I mean, we're kind of still in our technological infancy, but the human imagination is so great and so big. I love watching these episodes and seeing what they come up with within the limitations of their specific era. So um, so I definitely appreciate it for that. Um, <clears throat> the Nomad reminded me of the Daleks from <laughs> Doctor Who. <laughs> kept waiting for him to say exterminate exterminate <laughs> um and then um it also gave me a feeling of rough origins for data and the borg and um you know the the eradication of not imperfection and then also the creator you know created data and and that kind of storyline um, I love, I love that Uhura speaks a Swahili in this episode, and I love that she won that battle with the director, Mark Daniels. So, good job. And this might be a little bit sadistic, but <laughs> I had a little giggle when the red shirts got vaporized. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, red shirts, they're gone. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Wow, great stuff from Melissa. Sorry, Melissa the Sadist. What's going on there? Melissa, uh, what? I was thinking about the Sadist joke. I'm sorry. Jason M. Oaken, who does not take pleasure in the destruction of red shirts, he frowns at it. Uh, what do you think of this one? Oh, I absolutely frown at it. Uh, I rather enjoy it. I I've always enjoyed it. Uh, it moves pretty fast. And it's, a, you know, for a bottle show, that's a that has very interesting ideas it's 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 certainly something that's worth watching and enjoyable i mean certainly as we've talked about you know you see the themes coming back again and again and and walter i don't know what your reaction was when you you were working on the motion picture where that's been named where nomad has gone before <laughs> uh there's certainly you know shades of this and a lot of them and some people say it's pretty much ripped off and it's in, in its main part where you have your god machine but certainly, you know, for 1966, it was novel. And uh, this is John Meredith Lucas's introduction to Star Trek. Uh, and, you know, Walter, I don't know what, you know, how, whether you got to know him at all when he came back and produced the rest of the uh, second season and then directed some. So I don't know if you've had much interaction with him at all. But had a little. He was, a little. He's, he was pleasant. He was, he was pleasant. 
what can I tell you? And uh, I wasn't around. I wasn't around that much uh, at that juncture to come up with an in-depth uh, analysis of personality. And uh, I mean, this episode is really interesting in terms of its creation. We can talk about a lot of that later. One thing I will mention, since Walter's here is that uh, uh, the second draft, the last draft that he, you know, John Meredith Lucas wrote had quite a bit of Chekhov in it, apparently. And he didn't make it into the final episode at all. Is that right? I never knew that. Oh, oh. Mm. okay. So, did you yeah. read Did you read it, Jason? Do you have any insights as to what Chekhov was doing? I did not doing? read the draft. I, I just got this from Mark Cushman's book. I mean, he, he did say that there was quite a bit of Chekhov in it. And, uh, I, you know, one thing about the script, and since we're going into this, is it seems like, you know, at least Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn seem to have been uh, lenient on that script, partly to some speculate because they knew John Meredith Lucas didn't want to upset him. Uh, but it seems like Bob Justman and to some degree Dorothy Fontana were not too pleased with the original version and uh, you know, Dorothy supposedly rewrote it heavily before it went on the sc- uh, before, you know, uh, the finished version came out. And that's, you know, I guess where the Chekhov's part was basically written out. Uh, at what juncture, I don't know, but it's just, uh, it, it's really the process of it all. I mean, again, it's, it's enjoyable to watch. You know, one thing I'll mention that kind of, you know, stuck out to me is the score. It's all tracked. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is one of the later produced episodes. I mean, it just aired earlier, but it's one of the later produced episodes in the, in the second season. And some of the score just, because, you know, some of the, uh, some of some of these scores are so memorable. Some of these cues are so memorable that you associate them with different episodes, and they and they don't quite fit. There's some of Cat's Paw in here, which kind of sh- takes you out of it a little bit if you know Cat's Paw. There's some of Corbin might maneuver in here, and some and some other things. And it's just again, that, that's probably one thing that sort sort of took me out of it. But again, there are flaws in it, like in anything else. And but it's the bottom line is it's enjoyable, it's great, and I'd watch it again. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jason M. Oaken. Carrie Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear, is here. What's up, Carrie? What did you think of this episode? This one's kind of kind of fun. I I enjoyed Nomad. I liked the I liked the way he talked. His whole non sequitur, your facts are uncoordinated. Just every time he said it, it had me and me and Eric in stitches. And she, um. One thing I especially liked about it was Shatner's acting, especially near the end when he's trapping Nomad in the logic puzzle, was fantastic. It wasn't the normal over-the-top that we're used to seeing in, in most of his episodes. It was right. I, I thought it was re- pretty per, pretty perfect. It was nice, nice middle middle ground. And the way he the way he beats no, Nomad reminded me reminds me a lot of a great scene in the beginning of the fourth book of Stephen King's Dark Tower trilogy. There's a riddle contest with a computer computer on a train named Blaine that likes likes riddles and Eddie beats it by telling it a joke instead of a riddle. And it just causes Blaine's logic circuits to just go haywire and very much reminded me of the of the way Shat- Shatner did that. I thought Nurse Chapel was a fantastic teacher with with Uhura, she was like super patient with her, very much helping her out. I really enjoyed that, and I love Uhura when she yeah Uhura when she sings. She provides her own hold music, and that just amused the heck out of me. She was you know had to, had to do something while she was waiting for the guy to get her the information she needed, so she started singing. And li- a little bit later on, Scotty, your intentions are nice and all, you're like defending defending your your ladies. But this is the second episode in a row you've gotten your butt kicked by something by trying to defend them, and it just amused, just amused the heck out of me. You no, know, I feel so... I feel compelled to say something. Um, Please, you'll f- you forgive me, uh, because I am using history as a bullying tactic. I've been an actor for 60 years. Um, I have no, there's no love lost between me and Mr. Shatner. What? Can I finish, please? Sorry, sir. It is not accurate to say that his performance is over the top. His performance is committed. He is a committed Mm -hmm. actor. He Mm -hmm. takes more risks than most 
leading actors take. So my personal feelings notwithstanding, I feel I feel compelled to defend him as 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 an artist. And okay. I yeah, I absolutely ap- ap- appreciate that. It's not to my taste, but I felt the way he acted in that the scene at, at the end was it it held my my attention more than it usually does. And that's what okay. I, that's what I liked about it. Hmm. And before I get to my haiku, which I had a lot of fun making for this one, I found it fun fun fact that I thought was neat. The picture of Roy Kirk when they're looking up the original creator is a picture of the director from the episode wearing Scotty's dress uniform. I thought that was really neat. But for for the for the haiku, I we we wheels turned and I end, ended up settling on coming at it from from for for no from nomad's perspective. So we've got, and I'll try not to do a character of his voice, but we'll see how that goes. Nomad is perfect. Creator points out errors. Must now sterilize. Mm-hmm. Nomad definitely said, "I am nomad" a lot. I noticed. It was a lot of that. A lot of great. talking about himself in the third person. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks very much. Carrie Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear. Chris McGee is here. What's up, Chris? What would you think of this one? Uh, yes, the changeling. Uh, unfortunately, none of Odo's people show up in this episode. <laughs> but as with the M5 in The Ultimate Computer and Landrew in The Return of the Archons, this episode continues the fine tradition of the Kirk talks the computer to death trope that we all know and love. Um, side note, uh, several audio samples from this episode are used in the song Come With Me, one of my, uh, from one of my favorite 1980s groups ever, Information Society. I'll post a little link to it, chat, and if you happen to be watching or listening to this, I highly recommend you check it out and look it up. Uh, on a more serious note, the fact that they sort of minimize Uhura's re-education never sat well with me. Along with all of her knowledge, which, by the way, she probably should have included her own Swahili language, presumably Uhura lost all of her memories as well. Memories of her family, friends, life experiences, etc., Things that cannot simply be re-educated. So that always kind of bothered me. And for my memorable quote of the episode, I mean, I could have chosen something that was really memorable, like I am nomad, but instead I'll pick something less so. And that is, intelligence does not necessarily require bulk. I mean, if it did, I'd be a genius. Hey! (laughs) Excellent work. Thanks very much. Chris McGee. Allison Leach Hyde is here, and we are so glad she is. What did you think of this one? I like this episode. It's it's entertaining, and you know we start in straight on action. Like we are a minute and a half in, and we get to condition red, red alert. Like we're it. There's no holding back. Like we're we're diving into this story like head first. So I really like that. I love everyone shielding their eyes from the screen. <laughs> things explode i'm like we have transition lenses now i think our view screens probably would have adjusted for that by then but again at that time we didn't have transition lenses so why would that be something we would do um i too love ohura in this episode for singing i love that they've continued that into strange new worlds and she and celia also sings all the time hanging out on the bridge i'm like that's wonderful. I love that. Uh, one of the things I truly appreciate about this episode is that it passes the Bechdel test, which I think is fabulous for the 60s, because the scene between Chapel and Ahura are great. Chapel is a wonderful teacher, and and Nichelle is doing a wonderful job going between Swahili, which is not a language she speaks, and, mm-hmm. and English, and and showing that she is learning. And personally, I love the whole little bit about Bluey. (laughs) (laughs) Spelling in English is, you know, completely insane. So I love that little joke right there. It it 
hit me because I agree. Like, why is there an E on the end of blue? But okay, I get it. <laughs> um, I also really loved um, whenever we were following Nomad around the ship and we were like super low angle, like going mm -hmm. through the corridors. Loved that. And that mostly everyone has said everything else that I thought was fun. Oh, and I'm going to say one more thing. The Enterprise goes up to 11 and nobody turned into a wizard. True. <laughs> True. Uh, Walter, in an episode of Star Trek Voyager, uh, they figure out how Tom Paris figures out how to get to warp 10 and he and Janeway turn into salamanders and they make lizard babies. I know those are not interchangeable, but that's just what we call them. And uh, as Allison points out, the Enterprise went up to 11. Nobody turned into a futuristic yeah. reptile or amphibian. 10 is supposed to be instantaneous travel. You know, it's like the maximum, right? You're supposed to be, every that's why he was like everywhere all at once. So like, you know, knows? anyway. <laughs> well, speaking of which, Gregory Kenzo is up next. What's up, Greg Kenzo? Cool Neelix and Chill shirt. Ooh. Thanks. What do you think of this It was one? popular at STSF. Um, it was. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to watch these as I would a for, as like a first time viewer. And uh, because the reason it feels like it's been done before is because it's been done like a thousand times after this, you know. Um, so this could be, I'm not sure of how many side. Uh, sci-fi books came before this but this was you know right up there and this is right around the time with the moon landing as well so the space race was in full gear you know this was exciting because this a lot of people thought like this could be the near future you know like rapid growth and uh maybe not an alien that can kill four billion people but i mean at least traveling among the stars, you know, um, there's a few things that, I mean, didn't stand up, but this is canon. This is the original. So it, it technically is what you're supposed to follow, but mind melding with the machine, uh, Spock or 15, uh, it's not used anymore. Um, so I was surprised at that. Um, it's much colder of a show. Uhura loses her memories and everyone's like, okay, cool. Just teach her to read, <laughs> you know? Um, but it, I kind of make, it kind of makes sense because it's, she could have been killed. Right. So it, I kind of understand that, that attitude and we're coming out, out of, uh, people with recent war history. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not big on nitpicking, but, so if I had to rate this as a first time viewer, it would be an eight or a possibly a nine. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Thanks very much, Gregory Kenzo out in Hawaii. All right. Jake's final take. Sirach Lofton, any uh final thoughts? Um I I want to reiterate that I like that uh Majel and Ahura scene. I thought they had really good chemistry. I like that. Mm -hmm. I also liked um, when uh, Dr. McCoy and Spock were in the room together and Spock gives them a look like, well, doctor, let's see, you know, let's see what you got to say on this one. I, I like that moment there. It was just a small moment, but it was Spock kind of you know, being smug and ribbing at McCoy a little bit. And I liked it. Um, so those are the, the few moments. I also, you know, was trying to figure out why they needed those anti-gravity machines to hook up to Nomad, but it was explained by it being 500 kilos. So it would have been impossible to move without that. So I thought that's pretty smart writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, you know, there, there were elements that I did not like, but as far as being the first of its kind to kind of delve into this area, to this space of 
uh, computer gone haywire, you know, uh, attacking mankind. That was, a, a, you know, that's pretty revolutionary for the time period. So I give it credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, but there were more questions that I had. Uh, one, like what happened to those 4 billion people <laughs> that were eliminated? Like there wasn't really an explanation yeah. of how they were eliminated um, because fuck, told us there wasn't a nuclear event there wasn't any biological event so what exactly was the methodology methodology for exterminating mm -hmm. all these people um and then i felt like there could have also have been a moment where they would have confronted nomad about the four red shirts that were disappeared like hey can you bring them back or where did you send them or yep. you know they did not care <laughs> are they dead or did you just you know did uh, you know did you relocate them like there wasn't even a follow-up on that like you know are they dead did you beam them out somewhere or you know what, what's going on with that so i would have liked a little bit more concern for that but uh you know that's the red shirt red shirt trope that's mm -hmm. we always see so that's kind of funny in itself but um other than that, that's that's my that's my take on this. I did also want to say that uh, John Meredith Lucas had written on um, Alfred Hitchcock presents ten years before this uh, show, and so he was already um, highly regarded in the world of science fiction prior to coming into this Star Trek show. So mm -hmm. that's it. And John Meredith Lucas, not to be confused with John Lucas, the former coach of the San Antonio Spurs, everybody knows. Um, so I know Jason was all over that one. Walter Koenig, any final thoughts on this episode before we go? Well, you know, I think you got a, you got a, and I don't mean to embarrass him, but I think you got a real gem in Serac. He's very, he's very incisive. He knows what's, he, he understands the material. And he uh, articulates it extremely well. Um, it, I, it's you know, it's like, who do you uh, after you've seen the dog and the baby, who do you bring out? You know, it's you, you've got you, you got the the pearls already. So I, I'm I'm sitting here hat in hand, humbly trying to think of something that will be impressive after that. Very <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, and I'm serious. I'm you know very um uh, very intelligent analysis the only thing i could say is reiterate and my re my re my reiteration is that i compliment mark daniels on understanding that this was going to be a verbose show with a great deal of dialogue and that how do i mean how do i keep the audience's attention and i do it by doing uh, a, a host of close-ups by embracing the the audience and and forcing them to to be in involved, and uh, I think that's the that's the the contribution that Mark made that was uh, most successful. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much, Walter. Uh, that's it for us, everybody. Thank you to Greg Kenzo, Allison Leach Hyde, Chris McGee. Carrie Schwent, Jason M. Oaken, and Melissa Longo. For myself, Melissa Walter, Aaron Eisenberg, and Sirach Lofton. Thank you all very much for hanging out with us. We will see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>